This is story of a man who eluded suspicion for more than a decade. This is story of a serial killer who was living with someone and had a couple of children of his own, you are thinking about a monster you are looking for a guy who killed three women. You are thinking the worst, and when you finally find out who it is, you find out that he has a family of his own. This story started in 1989. Maria Ramos was the first victim. She had slipped into prostitution early in life and was often spotted on the corner of Jerome Avenue and 183rd Street in the Bronx, a well-known hotspot for pimps, prostitutes, and drug activity. On February 5, 1989, at 8.52 in the morning, 11 days after her daughter Shulich's third birthday, Ramos was found sprawled on a sidewalk next to a sewage plant in Yonkers. Her pale, lifeless body was naked, and she had been stabbed in the chest, strangled, and raped. Crime scene photos depict a scene of almost unimaginable horror. The killer had taken the time to position her body so that she was looking skyward, on her back with her legs spread and her hands tied behind her back with her own pantyhose. Her two front teeth had been punched out. At the scene, investigators found an empty boot visor bottle and Newport cigarette butts scattered in the snow. Ramos's jewelry had been left intact and her clothes were bunched in a corner, leading investigators to believe the crime was not committed as part of a botched robbery attempt. Autopsy results concluded that her death had been caused by strangulation. As part of standard procedure, Westchester County Medical Examiner's Office, took a vaginal swab that contained the killer's semen. A slide was made and sent to the Genelex Laboratory in Seattle, Washington, for DNA analysis. The DNA was run through a national database with the hopes that the killer would be identified through an existing genetic profile. No match was found. Two years later on March 28, 1991, at 10 a.m. the body of Tawanda Hodges, 28, was discovered lying naked on a pile of gravel in the backyard of a fuel oil storage terminal in Yonkers, just 820 feet from where Ramos's body had been found two years earlier. It was a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and the infant leaves of spring had just begun to sprout. A worker who was cutting through a massive cinder block wall had peered over the ledge, spotted the gruesome sight, and called the cops. Hodges, who had been working as a prostitute in the Bronx, had been brutally beaten, raped, and strangled. She was left naked and face up. Her socks, full of dirt and mud, were still on. As in the Ramos case, her hands had been tied behind her back with her own pantyhose and her tattered clothes were found a few feet from the body. An empty boot visor bottle and a pile of Newport cigarette butts were close by. Hodges, who was black, had a sweet, girlish smile and was the mother of three young children. Upon seeing her granddaughter's body in the casket, Hodges's elderly grandmother collapsed on the floor of the funeral parlor and was pronounced dead shortly thereafter. Autopsy results concluded that Hodges, like Ramos, had died of strangulation and had been killed shortly before her body had been discovered. Once again, a DNA sample was extracted and sent to lab for analysis, because investigators had not yet connected the two murders, the sample was not cross-checked with the Ramos murder. The final murder took place at the Trade Wines Motor Court Motel in Yonkers on May 24, 1996. Before being demolished in early 2002, the Trade Wines a decrepit, three-story complex with rooms that could be rented by the hour had been a well-known hangout for drug addicts and prostitutes. Kimberly Moore, 30, was a talented, young, black woman who had fallen on hard times. Unlike the other two victims, she had never been arrested and was a star student in high school. Born in France, she was bilingual and, before getting hooked on drugs, had been a standout athlete. She was the mother of two vivacious children. Sometime in the early afternoon, Carlos Gonzalez, who worked the front desk at the Trade Wines, 
spotted Kimberly being followed by a man carrying a brown bag. In later testimony, Gonzalez would describe the man as having a macho walk, a kind of bopping from side to side, like he had something to prove. It would be the last time Kimberly was seen alive. The pair went to room 45 on the second floor, right above the office. At 6.45 in the evening, Moore's body was discovered by a maid. The scene was similar to the previous murders. Strangled, raped, naked, hands tied this time with a telephone cord. Her large silver hoop earrings were still attached to her earlobes and the blue watch on her left wrist was still ticking. Large globs of purple mascara covered her closed eyelids. She had a long, bloody gash on her forehead that detectives believed was the result of her being smashed with the room's telephone. In the room, investigators found an empty 40-ounce boot visor bottle, a brown paper bag, ten Newport cigarettes butts in the toilet, and a bag of crack pipes and needles on the dresser. Once again, autopsy results showed the cause of death to be strangulation, and DNA samples taken from the victim were recorded and analyzed. This time, however, a Yonkers homicide detective who had been present at all three crime scenes, finally connected the dots. He petitioned for all three DNA samples to be cross-checked for matches a process that, at the time, was both costly and time-consuming. A few weeks later, the results were in, the samples matched. It was the same killer in all three murders. Police now knew they were dealing with a serial killer. Investigators linked them because each woman was found strangled, naked, bound at the hands and facing upward. They were also linked to each other by DNA, but police did not know whose DNA it was. But, once again, as had happened five years earlier, Moore's case stalled. Even with an eyewitness, detectives didn't make much headway, leads petered out, and the case eventually went cold. It was years later when Francisco Acevedo, 41, was being held on his third felony DWI conviction, a charge that carried a sentence of one to three years. As part of an earlier release program, he had consented to a buccal swab test a special Q-tip-like swab rolled around inside the cheek to gather DNA. Not knowing that he had left significant amounts of DNA in his victims and that his DNA was now in Cody's, the suspect figured this would be an easy option for getting out of prison a little early. Pending approval by the parole board, he would have been released a few months after the DNA test had been processed. The buccal swab from the suspect had been entered into the system and was identical to the swabs taken from the bodies of the victims. The match was cross-checked and verified by Genelex, and the Westchester County Lab was notified of the hit shortly thereafter. The odds that this match was not the suspect's DNA stood at a staggering 1 in 6 billion. Detective John Geis who was dealing this cold case was informed immediately by Westchester County Lab. Geis had been working on it for a decade. It had consumed him. For Geis, then an almost 25-year veteran of the Yonkers Police Department, it was a decade wrought with frustration, one spent following dead-end leads, staking out dive bars in the middle of the night to gather cigarette butts with traces of saliva, traveling the country to interview strung-out prostitutes and gun-wielding drug dealers yet his countless hours of hard work his decade-long investigation, had yielded nothing. After the phone call with the lab, Geis rushed back to his Yonkers office a small space made smaller by the dozens of boxes of evidence that had been stacked to the ceiling cleared a path to his computer, and printed out the suspect's rap sheet. It was extensive numerous assaults against women, attempted rape, drunk driving, attempted kidnapping. Geis held his breath as he checked to see if the suspect had been incarcerated during any of the murders. He hadn't. His brief moments of freedom had coincided perfectly with the killings. For his own satisfaction, Geis pulled up the suspect's mug shot and stared at it for a while. Was this the guy? He actually didn't look that bad. He had square glasses, a goatee, short, 
cropped hair. He didn't look angry or psychotic certainly not like a serial killer. Geis knew the next few weeks would be rough hours and hours of work to properly investigate and document the suspect. Less than a week after receiving the news of a Cody's hit, Geis, accompanied by Detective Wilson Gonzalez of the Yonkers PD, drove seven hours to Gowanda Correctional Facility in Collins, New York, 370 miles north of Yonkers. A room at Gowanda was prepared for an interview three chairs and a desk. Geis had brought pictures of the three victims. He was going to play nice at first, take a soft and friendly tone, and slowly reel the suspect in. The metal door swung open. Dressed in green prison scrubs, and still sporting a goatee, the suspect walked in and sat down. This was the moment Geis had been thinking about for ten years. Francisco A. Acevedo Jr. that was who detectives Geis and Gonzalez were now sitting across from. When he walked into the interview room, Geis immediately noticed the bop walk. He walked like he was about to start a fight, his head swaying back and forth, like a real tough guy. He wasn't tall maybe 5'7 or even muscular, and he had a small paunch that was visible through his prison scrubs. He had a mole below his right eye and a tattoo on his right hand that read Jessica. He had worked odd jobs in and around Yonkers for the past few years and was married with three children, two boys and a girl. Acevedo managed to stay under the radar, he got locked up in Yonkers in 1998 for assaulting his wife and was subsequently charged with a felony. If he had gotten convicted, his DNA would have been taken from him and put into Cody's. But the case was pleaded to a misdemeanor and they didn't take a DNA sample because they didn't take samples for misdemeanors. Geis took it slow at first. He introduced himself to Acevedo as a detective who regularly made the rounds at local prisons, checking in on various cold cases, looking for witnesses, searching for clues. He said that he knew Francisco had been in Yonkers at the time of the murders and wondered if he might have information regarding who had committed the crimes. No. He didn't know anything about it. Geis pushed on. He carefully laid out the pictures of the victims on the table. Recognize any of these girls? No. Not to his recollection. Acevedo was getting jittery. He crossed his arms and started to shift nervously in his chair. Why not lighten the conversation a little? Geis asked Acevedo if he liked to drink. Yes? What is your drink of choice? Acevedo calmed slightly and answered that he was a fan of Budweiser. What about smoking, do you smoke? Geis carefully wrote down Acevedo's answer on a legal pad Newport's. Budweiser and Newports. He had seen those two words hundreds of times during the course of the investigation. They were all over the case file. It was all starting to come together, and Guy sensed it was time to play hardball. Pointing to each picture, his voice reaching a piercing intensity, he said, Well, Francisco, guess what? I know you knew her, and I know you knew her and I know you knew her. Your DNA was found in every girl. We know you killed these girls, Francisco. Acevedo wasn't about to admit anything. He immediately requested an attorney. Geis finally had his man and murder charges would be filed in the morning. He knew Acevedo was the killer, now he had to prove it. In the months that followed, Geis flew down to Florida to interview a woman who had been brutally raped and beaten by Acevedo in the mid-80s. The woman, who wished not to be identified for this piece, told Geis that Acevedo had dragged her into a wooded area, tied her hands with her own panties, and choked and raped her. The incident probably would have ended with her murder had he not collapsed, drunk, on her naked body. The woman ran to a nearby home, frantically knocked on the door, told the man who answered what had happened, and waited as the man and his son plunged into the woods with loaded shotguns. Acevedo was arrested and charged, but the case was pleaded down to a lesser charge, 
and he was sentenced to two years in state prison, eventually being released on June 28, 1988, just seven months prior to the Ramos murder. When Geis presented the woman with a photo lineup, she pointed to Acevedo's face without hesitation. That's him. That's the man that raped me, she said tearfully. In all, Guy spent two additional years investigating the case, speaking with dozens of people who had come in contact with Acevedo, presenting photo arrays, organizing hundreds of boxes of evidence, assisting Westchester 2nd Deputy District Attorney Patricia Murphy and Chief of the Career Criminal Bureau Timothy Ward in their preparations for the trial. He was getting to the office early and leaving late, keeping the families updated on his progress, making sure they knew that he was not going to let this one get away. On October 26, 2011, 23 months after Acevedo had been identified as a suspect, the trial began. The evidence against Acevedo was almost insurmountable. His DNA was found in all three victims an eyewitness had placed him at the scene of the Trade Wines Motel murder, he had previously worked at the loading dock of the sewage treatment plant where Ramos's body had been found, and he had committed several horribly violent crimes against women. Gonzalez, a former motel clerk and the only person to have seen accused serial killer Francisco Acevedo with any of his alleged victims, testified at Acevedo's triple murder trial in Westchester County Court. Geis testified. He was on the stand for three long hours. After eleven years as a cold case detective, he had become an expert at testifying, making sure to carefully answer questions. He laid out the details of his exhaustive investigation, his ten years of searching, his interview with Acevedo at Gaonda Correctional Facility, and his conclusion that Acevedo was, without a doubt, the man who had brutally raped and murdered Maria Ramos, Tawanda Hodges, and Kimberly Moore. The jury deliberated for longer than expected two and a half days. Dash. Finally, on November 14, 2011, a verdict was reached. Guilty. 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 Three counts of first-degree murder. This criminal would never again see the light of day. Francisco Acevedo the serial killer who avoided detection for 20 years, was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison.